before we get started, I want to let you know about one of our upcoming programs, our 2019 Founders Day Symposium, Root Awakenings, with featured speaker Anne Belford Ulanov. It will be on March 30th in downtown Chicago at Fourth Presbyterian Church. For more information about that program, visit our website, youngchicago.org. Welcome to the Jungian Anthology Podcast, analytical psychology seminars from the archives of the C.G. Jung Institute of Chicago. Facing the Gods, Archetypal Patterns of Existence, with John Van Enwick, Ph.D. Experiencing the archetypes as personified gods and goddesses active in our lives reveals the great powers shaping our moods, choices, and actions. Facing the Gods, Archetypal Patterns of Existence, illuminates the Olympian stories that serve as reflecting pools where we, as psychic heirs of Greece, discover ourselves. By recognizing the gods and goddesses at work, we can gain release from archetypally determined patterns. It was recorded in 1991. This episode is the first lecture in the series called Preparing to Meet the Gods, The Soul Turned Inward. Other lectures in the series include Hera, by Lois Kahn, Hermes by Murray Stein, Demeter and Kore by Lucille Klein, Athena by Anne Avery, Zeus by Lee Roloff, Aphrodite and Eros by James Wiley, and Dionysus by Caroline Stevens. Dr. John Van Enwick received his PhD in Religion and Psychological Studies from the University of Chicago. A clinical psychologist and training analyst with the Pacific Northwest Society of Jungian Analysts, he maintains a private practice in Jungian analysis in Olympia, Washington. He is also an ordained priest in the Episcopal Church and a clinical instructor at the University of Washington School of Medicine. The author of Archetypes and Strange Attractors, The Chaotic World of Symbols, he publishes widely and lectures internationally on both Jungian psychology and the treatment of torture survivors. There will be links in the show notes to the complete series, as well as other lectures by Dr. Van Enwick. And remember, for anyone who wants to support this podcast, instead of making a donation, find something that you're interested in in our online store, either this series or something else. Purchases from the store support my work doing this podcast and ensure that we'll continue to do it in the future. Now here's the lecture. Tonight we're starting off a lecture series of eight lectures on facing the gods, which is a topic dear to any Jungian's heart for any number of reasons. Uh, first of all, and I think probably foremost, it puts us directly in touch with that realm of the psyche that we refer to as the collective unconscious. So before we go any farther, let me ask a few questions. How many of you here uh, have had a course in Jungian psychology previous to this? Raise your hands if you have. Okay. Uh, how many of you have read any Jung previous to this? Okay. How many of you are familiar with words like archetype? Okay. Uh, how about uh, collective unconscious? Okay. All right. Then we have a pretty good basis on which to, to begin here. I think the second reason why uh, the study of, of the gods, so to speak, is, is so interesting to, uh, to Jungian psychology is that it puts us directly in touch with the arts. The arts have always been considered uh, by Jung to be a rich source of understanding about the psyche. And these are the literary arts, the visual arts. And then thirdly, uh, so many of us uh, are also interested in religion. And the gods and religion are, of course, somewhat inseparable. Do any of you have 
a favorite myth. Do any of you here know a myth that you could actually recite? Raise your hand if you know a myth that you can recite. You're not going to be asked to do it, so just let me see. Okay, so there, there is no individual here who knows a myth that they can repeat. How many of you have had a course in mythology, academically or, okay, two people. How many of you have had a course in the history of religion? Okay. How many of you had a, ever had a course in psychology? Okay. So what brings us all together really is the psychological dimension of the gods and mythology. So what we're going to want to do tonight is look at where myths come from, why they're worth studying, particularly from a psychological perspective, and then in the next seven sessions of this course, you will be studying particular gods. Okay? And tonight we're going to play with this in a very different manner in that we're going to look at modern examples of mythology. Let's start off, first of all, with a definition of myth. Who would like to define myth for us? What is a myth? Other people's religion. Other people's religion, okay. That's a Joseph Campbell's kind of uh, joking definition of myth. Uh huh. And what does he mean by that? Well, it means obviously we don't see our own religion as mythology, but as sacred and beyond being tampered with in that way. Right, very good. So that we're talking about other people's religions when we're talking about myth. <laughs> now that immediately sets up a dichotomy between religion and myth. My religion is my religion. Your religion is your myth. Okay? What's the difference between religion and myth? Take a stab at it. What do you think? Consider the phrase just rendered that myth is other people's religion. Okay? What would the difference between other people's religion and my religion be? If we're going to in some way create an analogy between other people's religion and myth, we can approach it through that perspective. What's the difference between my religion and somebody else's? A matter of belief. A matter of belief. Yeah. Yeah. So what's the difference between my belief and somebody else's belief? That's, that's what it comes down to with the bottom line, doesn't it? Yeah, my religion is true and yours is just a myth. And we use that phrase a lot. This economic package which been, has been proposed to Congress may sound good, but it really it's just a myth. The idea that we can lower inflation and at the same time reduce the deficit is a myth. Myth has become to mean in our culture something that is delusional or at least an illusion a delusion being something that we confuse with reality, an illusion being something that really has no basis in reality whatsoever. So when we talk about myths and when we talk about the gods in our contemporary society, we are very definitely talking about, with regard to the common view of things, something that just isn't true, something that should have been left behind years ago. And yet, as I will attempt to show tonight, our culture is coming somewhat full circle with regard to the role of myth in terms of the, uh, the functioning of our culture, and that there's one dimension of our culture that is radically departing from myth, and as a result, we are all suffering very greatly. Or as Joseph Campbell, again, would say, we in Western civilization have gotten too far from the collective unconscious, and we are suffering as a result. About four or five years ago, a man named John Pfeiffer published a book called The Creative Explosion. Has anyone read The Creative Explosion or seen it? This is a fascinating book, simply fascinating book, about the caves in southern France and northern Spain, particularly the cave at Lascaux. John Pfeiffer is an anthropologist, archaeologist, very interested in the history of man. And what he did was began to look into these caves to find out what they were all about. And his experiences, which he recounts in the book, went something like this. On one particular occasion, 
when he went into the caves, and of course the caves generally are closed to the public because to open them to the modern atmosphere is to open them to destruction because of the, the chemicals in the atmosphere so that the caves have to be protected. He went in with, a, with a, an investigative team, and they looked at the various images on the wall. Now, you're all familiar with these. You, you all, I'm sure, had them in any introductory art course you ever took, where you saw the drawing of the animal on the cave in southern Europe, and the idea that this was one of the earliest renditions of art. And the old idea was, what was going on with regard to that pursuit? There have been a lot of cartoons about that, cartoons of people sitting around sharing drinks while someone is drawing on the cave wall and someone says, I really don't like this new impressionistic art, I don't think it's going to last, you know, this sort of thing. So we've always wondered just what kind of a role that played, and this was Pfeiffer's concern also. So he went into the caves with his electronic torches and looked at various paintings and began to realize that the caves were not simply painted at their entrances, but were painted as far back as a mile underground. Not only were the caves painted, but many of the stalactites and the stalagmites that inevitably occur in these caves had been carved. Sometimes they had been carved uh, with regard to images that were already somewhat present in the stalactite. Other times they were completely new creations. And he realized that these caves were almost museums of art. And then one day, when he was in the cave, I think at Lascaux, he had a profoundly insightful experience, and that was that the battery in the lamp that they were using failed. It went dead. I had not expected that. The guides who were with them, of course, were well prepared for this eventuality and did precisely what had been done in the years before the electric torch. They had with them bottles of kerosene with wicks. I'm sure you've all seen these before. It's a kind of makeshift torch. And they lighted the wicks, and in the flickering light of these torches, all the various paintings and sculptures in the cave came to life. And he realized for the first time that this cave was set up not only as an art display, but as a living theater in which actual scenarios were coming to life in the flickering of the light, because every time the wick, the, the flame flickered, the, the painting would move. And he began to realize that this sculpture here in front of him and that painting at the far wall were interacting with one another in the flickering of the light. And he began to think that what these caves were were memnonic devices, M-N-E-M-O-I-O-N-I-C, memnonic devices, in which people were brought in the midst of this very dark, totally sensory-deprived environment. The torches were suddenly lighted, and what they saw impressed upon their consciousness items of data that they needed to know. We live in a culture right now, interestingly enough, that has somewhere in the neighborhood of 300 trillion new bits of information added to it every year. We, in our world today, have the equivalent of 2 million volumes of the Encyclope Encyclopedia Britannica presented to us anew every year. How do we keep on top of it? How do we remember it? Pardon me? We don't. We, don't. we talk of da Vinci as being the last real Renaissance man, the last one who could master all the knowledge of the time. That was over years ago. But back in the days when it was important to know how to hunt, when it was important to understand what the religion surrounding the hunt was, art was a device for impressing upon the memory information needed to be known. This was happening over 130,000 years ago. Now, if we're going to talk about where that then went, we have to talk about three strains. We have to talk about art, we have to talk about religion, and we have to talk about psychology. And you can see right away that in terms of cognitive psychology, that is the way in which people learn how to think, the cognitive psychology was present in that Lascaux experience of 130,000 years ago. It was not called cognitive psychology, of course, but it was there. And what Jung would say is that what was being encoded on the walls of Lascaux 130,000 years ago not only was meant to be impressed upon the consciousness of those who saw it, 
but it came directly out of the collective unconscious of the group as a whole. So in effect, what the cave at Lascaux was, and this is the whole point of facing the gods, the cave at Lascaux was the psyche speaking to itself, was the mind programming its own development. Collective images would surface in external representations that were then impressed upon consciousness. And that is still going on today. All of art, all of religion, all of psychology, in effect, all meta-theory, in other words, the theory of theories, can be reduced to the way in which consciousness portrays its own development. You can look at the Old Testament, for example, from Genesis right on up through, and we know very well that the books in the Old Testament are not chronologically represented. Some later books predate some of the earlier books, and Genesis is actually a, a later book. You can look at the Bible as the psyche's account of its coming to consciousness. Now, if you've had a previous course in Jungian psychology, you know that really the bedrock, the, the cornerstone of Jung's theory, is that consciousness develops out of the unconscious. And that no matter how large consciousness ever gets, it only accounts for, well, he never put a percentage on it, but I do, say about 10% of the total psyche. That we are 90% unconscious and about 10% conscious. And that as we become more aware of what's going on around us and within us, we develop an ego. And the rest of the psyche, and that's, uh, that's somewhat a misstatement because the ego is part of the whole psyche, the psyche as a whole is called the self. The self is all that in the unconscious that, that is instrumental in the development of the ego. The self is the psyche as a whole, which contains within it the blueprint or plan for psychological development that has as its primary goal adaptation, the survival of the mechanism or the organism, which we are. So what we have here is we have a large unconscious matrix that exists at birth that has within it intentionality. In other words, when we are born, we are not simply tabula rasas waiting to be programmed by whatever learning we, we uh, experience. We have personalities already in, in, in the germ plasm ready to emerge. And as this personality develops over time, there is something within the psyche that monitors development and leads the ego into the experiences it needs for growth. So when we talk about nature and nurture, the nature part of it for Jungian psychology is the self. Now, as the ego becomes more and more aware of the self, it becomes more and more aware of vague apprehensions of something influencing its destiny. And what Jung felt was that the only way to tap into the actual stuff of how that was happening was through symbol. Symbols are that which guide psychological development. Jung felt that symbols were valenced images, images that have a compelling effect on the observer. When one is confronted with a symbol, the one thing one can be assured of is that one will not be able to not respond. One is compelled to respond to symbols, sometimes repelled by them, sometimes attracted to them, sometimes set off on an entirely new course as a result of their interaction with one's consciousness. Now, as symbols begin to direct our growth, obviously one of the most important things we can do is learn how to interpret them. And this, for Jung, was the subject of his life's work. He looked at alchemy, he looked at mythology, he looked at folktale, he looked at occult uh, science, he looked at hard science, he looked to art, he looked everywhere because he felt that symbols were present everywhere and to learn how to read them was to learn how to understand what one's destiny was, where one, quote, had to go, unquote, what one had to do. 
And for those of you who have begun to interpret symbols, and for those of you who are very sophisticated at interpreting symbols, recognize that the deepest and most compelling interpretation of symbols is rarely representable rationally. It's an apprehension. It's a vague understanding. It's a living with. It's a being penetrated by and penetrating into the matter of the symbol. Now, when we talk about understanding our destiny, we are smack dab back in the center of what will be the subject of this course, myth. And particularly in this course, as you may have noted, Greek myth. Greek myth existed to accomplish a number of tasks. Greek myth existed to explain why things happened the way they did. Things happen the way they do because there are gods, and the gods play with us. The gods make sport of us. The gods make light of us. The gods make love to us. You want to know why there can be an Achilles, why there can be a Hercules, why some individuals within the human race can rise to greater heights than their fellow humankind? It's because they are the sons and daughters of gods or have somehow been chosen by the gods to be singled out for something special. So if you want to know why things happen the way they do, it's because the gods will it. Now, the myths also existed to inspire, not only to explain, but to inspire. In other words, if there can be a Hercules, if there can be an Achilles, you too could conceivably do that yourself. And the goal for the heroes of the Greek culture was glory. Look for glory. Look to accomplish that which is greater than what you think you can do. Go for the laurel wreath. Grab for the gold. Do something above and beyond what you think you can. So that there was a, a, a functioning part of myth that helped people in that time to rise above the ordinary dreck of everyday life and accomplish something better. Now, as part and parcel of this inspiration was a third function of myth, which was to warn people and to say, okay, now you've done that, beware of becoming possessed by the desire for glory. Beware of being proud of your accomplishments. This is hubris. You all have heard of the Greek word hubris. And when you become subject to hubris, and possessed by your own pride in your accomplishments, Nemesis, that great goddess, will bring you to your knees. She will come get you, and she will reduce you to the state of humanity, mortality, where you belong. Now, fourth and finally, with regard to myths, explaining, inspiring, warning, was they were there to entertain. And we must never lose sight of that. And we're going to end this lecture with a quote from S.I. Hayakawa, in a book called The Quest for Vision, and we'll talk about that then. But the myths were also highly entertaining. They were the subject of epic poetry. The Hesiods and the Homers <laughs> and the Ovids of their day were very interested in taking these mythological motifs and creating a language that could, could rise to the glory of the subject matter. And we know that drama and poetry were a big part of myth. These things were portrayed. But there's another dimension of myth that we want to talk about here, and that would be the psychological religious dimension of myth and the cults that existed in Greece. In trying to explain how myths arose, and keeping in mind that myths are a relatively late phenomenon in the history of humankind, many people feel, for example, that folktale predates myth. We have to begin to look at what inspired humankind to begin to put down these stories in the first place? If this is the unconscious talking to itself, how did it educate humankind to begin to do this sort of thing? And the first thing generally thought of by people who look at this sort of thing are the fetishes that began to develop early in the history of humankind when graves are opened that are very, very old, when communities are uncovered that are extraordinarily ancient, generally there are a bunch of what would be called by us symbolic representations of something that are always unearthed in the excavations. 
uh, one of the earliest and one of the most famous is the fertility figure, the, the, uh, the fertility symbol that came out of, I think, uh, one of the caves in Spain from 50, 70,000 years ago that is basically a, a very obese woman. Actually, what it is, it's a pregnant woman who is naked and who was found in uh, a, a particular village. And the thought was that this fertility symbol, this fetish, was something that was supposed to help humankind influence destiny. Now, if we think about that, if we imagine to ourselves, well, how would such a thing occur? How would such a figure develop? It would probably go something like this. And now, at this point, we have to stop for a moment. We have to gather our wagons in a circle. We have to build an altar. And we have to give a sacrifice of apology to the primitives into whose minds we are about to project all our modern presumptions about what they were doing. This also, of course, has been the subject of many jokes and cartoons throughout the ages. We don't know how all this stuff evolved. We're surmising. But knowing enough about ourselves as we do, and having had experience with some tribes that we consider to be primitive that are alive and existing today, we can begin to say somewhat of the following thing. Let's suppose, for example, that we live in a jungle somewhere, we are a tribe that is dependent on what the jungle can produce for us in order for us to be able to stay alive. And suddenly, for some reason, there is a drought, a fire, uh, an overly wet season, or, or a scarcity of animals, and we don't have enough to eat. And things are beginning to get desperate, and those of us who hunt are beginning to become very frustrated by not finding anything in the forest. And those of us who prepare uh, to receive that which is brought in from the hunt to turn it into usable stuff for the tribe are frustrated at our waiting that goes on and on. And one day, one of us is walking through the forest and is suddenly struck by the beauty of a tree. Perhaps one of the forest trees has just burst into flower or something like that. But for just one moment, we are alerted to the fact that there's something here that's really quite beautiful, even though there are others in the forest like it. And shortly thereafter, or almost immediately corresponding with that event, we see some game, a deer, a monkey, whatever. And as luck would have it, when we aim our bow or our blowgun, it has the desired effect and we are able to procure food for those who wait for us back home. There's a very strong possibility that the two events will become associated in our minds. Now, this is not even a primitive phenomenon exclusively. We do it ourselves. If we do something and it works, we will often try doing it again to try to influence destiny. Uh, I'm sure all of you have your own personal little, what we call, superstitions. You know, knock wood. Well, see, there are spirits in the wood, and we have to keep them apprised of our presence. So that's why we knock wood. But we have all kinds of little fetishes that we rely on to try to influence our destiny the way we want. If we're looking for a job, well, actually, uh, a friend of mine was selling his house once, and he's Roman Catholic, and had heard that if you bury a statue of a particular saint, maybe some of you even know this, upside down in your front yard, the house will sell. And he did, and it did. And so here we have what would be called behavior at the level of the fetish. But that primitive who was in the forest that day and saw that tree over there when the game appeared, associating the two events in his or her mind, will suddenly begin to define the essence of that tree, not in terms of what it has in common with other trees, leaves, a trunk, roots, fruit, whatever, but in terms of that particular event on that particular day. So that that tree there now is a special tree. He might even carve a little representation of it or take a piece of bark from it or take a twig from it and keep that with him in the attempt to influence some sort of destiny. It is a very primitive, and of course primitive is not confined, as, as I've said a couple of times, to past times. We also do very primitive things. It's a primitive attempt to explain how things happen and through understanding them, to be able to recreate them again. Now, when we're talking about art, religion, and psychology, we now have to add another discipline when we talk about the replication of results. And what's that? 
Science. Now we're getting into science. This is the earliest science. And all of these are just accreted together like a big conglomerate. The fetish is the art, it's the religion, it's the psychology, and it's the science. Well, a little while later, along down the line, as this developing science begins to get going, humankind begins to wonder just what it is that makes the difference between someone who is awake and who is asleep. What makes the difference between someone who is alive and someone who is dead? Have any of you ever seen anyone die? Raise your hand if you've ever seen anyone die. Okay. After they were dead, did you ever wonder what it was that was different from them a couple of moments before when they were alive? Well, one of the things that we all came up with early on in our history was animation. Obviously, a person who is dead can't get up and move around, although they look exactly the same. And their bodily organs and all of their physical structures are still the same. Something's gone. Now, today, in modern science, we have changed, for example, from looking at death as being a function of the heart, if the heart stops beating, you're dead, to a function of the brain. And 10, 15 years ago, there was an enormous controversy in this country about changing the legal definition of death from heart death to brain death. And if I'm not exactly incorrect, there are some parts of the country today that still do not accept brain dead as dead. So we, we still don't really know what the difference between life and death is, but the early people solved it. They felt that there was some connection with breath, some connection with spirit, that there was something in the body that was not confined to the body, so that in death it left, and also in sleep. So that if, in the middle of the night, I dream that you come visit me, in effect, you did. It was your spirit that came and visited me. We've now gone from fetishism to animism, and we're looking at that which actually creates life, that which actually is the human. Now, as soon as we get into that, and as soon as we start looking at breath, we get all kinds of things like creation myths, in which air moves across water to create something new. There are two examples of that in modern-day Judeo-Christian tradition. We know that God, in creating Adam, breathed into Adam. Here's the breath. We know also that Jesus, upon being baptized by John, all the people who are there witness a, a wind blowing across the water, and that's been interpreted as the second creation, the new creation. Something different has happened. Now, as people began to explain things in terms of breath and in terms of fetishism, we begin to see that something's happening. That is, that we're beginning to feel that there is a power inherent in those everyday things in our lives that can affect other things, and we're beginning to feel that there is something that we can't see that surrounds us, that contains us, that influences our destiny. Now, generally, what's thought is that the next step in this process were the ancestor cults, ancestor myths. In other words, as tribes developed and as accounts were handed down of people's experiences and exploits through the ages, people began to realize that those who came before them seemed to know a lot more than they did seemed to be larger than life and that it was their goal in life and duty in life to live up to that which preceded them, their ancestors. Their ancestor shrines in the Far East right now where one actually considers the ancestors to be like gods in a sense, not like God. There is a distinction made, but like gods. Now, the interesting thing about this, when we talk about these ancestor cults, is that it's an exact reversal of what Western civilization believes today. It is a modern Western myth, if you will, that every child becomes more experienced or more highly developed than the parent, and that this is how society progresses. Back then, it was quite the opposite. It was unusual if you, could arrive, if you could raise yourself to the level of your ancestors. And, of course, that's perfectly easy to understand, and it's, about, it's, it's another foundation of psychoanalysis, and that is that as we grow, it is our parents who teach us most of what we learn. Then we end up going to school, and we learn things there, too. 
but it's the adults in our environment, particularly our parents, who are our gods. They know it all. They know everything. And it's a very difficult thing, particularly for people in modern United States culture, for children to take the place of their parents. Freud, for example, talked about it as the Oedipus conflict and the son's slaying of the father to get to the mother, etc. and so forth. Jung said, as, as we often emphasize in the difference between Freudian and Jungian psychology, that Freud was absolutely right, absolutely accurate. The problem is he didn't realize that that view of killing the father to get to the mother was not simply that, but it was something beyond that, which was the child's desire to transcend the patriarchal principle to get back in touch with the ground of his or her being so that it's archetypal, it's symbolic. Sons don't really want to kill their fathers to get to their mothers. Daughters certainly don't want to kill their mothers to get to the fathers. The one thing that we can say, if any of you have ever had children, is that the children love more than anything else the opportunity to get between the parents. In other words, children will split one parent off from the other every chance they get. They would like to have the parent all to themselves. But ultimately comes the day when the child has to supersede the parent. And again, we are facing that in our culture in ways that we have never faced that before. Because we now have people in middle age who not only are bringing up children, but are taking care of their parents. Because of modern medicine and the whole question of when people should die and when people can die, we find children taking care of their parents for years and years and years and years. And if you want to know the pain of having to supersede the parent, talk to anyone who has to put their mother or father in a nursing home or talk to anyone whose mother or father has Alzheimer's. It's a very awkward and uncomfortable position. And that's the way it was throughout humankind. So there always was the view that somehow the ancestors were greater than we are. Now, as this begins to develop, we begin to get the place of gods. We begin to get a pantheon. We begin to understand that there's something going on in all of these events that has a kind of intentional character and therefore participates in agency. Are you all familiar with the word agency? Agency means there's an agent doing it. It's not just thundering and lightning out there. We have a god who is doing something. Of course, when we were kids, it was God is moving his piano. That's what the thunder is. But in Germany, it was Wotan. Wotan was loose. Uh, who's the god of thunder and lightning in Norse mythology? Is, is it Vulcan? Uh, we used to talk about that one, too. Pardon me? Vulcan is Roman, isn't it? Vulcan? Is Vulcan Roman? Yeah, okay. I'm trying to think of the... Thor. 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 Thor, right, and his hammer, all of that. There's an agent up there. There's somebody doing it. Now, in Greek mythology, this is really very, very interesting because when we look at Greek mythology, we have to realize that a number of things were going on. First of all, the Greek mythology that we read today has virtually nothing to do with the people who inhabited Greece. This is one of those incredibly interesting paradoxical statements. What happened was there was a people inhabiting Greece who had many deities basically of the land. And then there was a large influx, a migration of people over the mountains into the peninsula of Greece who brought with them their gods. And when they brought with them their gods, over a period of time, their gods were grafted onto the gods that were there. Now, this was something that really, in many ways, is still alive in Greece today. In 1983, uh, the International Association of Analytical Psychology had its convention in Jerusalem. And uh, when my wife and I went over to attend the conference, we decided that I had to lecture in Holland on the way back that we would go overland from Jerusalem to Holland rather than flying. So we took the ferry boat from Jerusalem to Crete. And we stayed for a week in Crete, and we rented a car, and we drove around. Now, I had, up to that point, not ever really been a student of it. I had actually been a student of Greek mythology, but it was never anything I had really grasped particularly strongly. So I wasn't aware of what we were going to experience. We drove, has anyone ever been to Crete? Raise your hand if you've ever been to Crete. Really an incredibly rugged country, gorgeous. Did you go up onto the Lasithi Plain at all? The Lasithi Plain is where all the windmills are, up outside Heraklium, just to the, to the east and south of Heraklium. Drive up, 
and there's a road that goes around this valley, which is really basically an old crater that's collapsed and now is all filled in. We drove up to this area called the La Siti Plain, up switchback road after switchback road after switchback up. We got to the place where the border of this plateau met with the plain that was coming up from the sea, and there were entire rows of windmills. And you've probably seen pictures of those windmills on tourist posters. They're made of white stone, and they have large wooden arms with sails on them that you can furl and unfurl when the wind is blowing or not, as the case may be, whenever you want to use it. And I thought, well, obviously it must be fairly windy up here. This is rugged country. And we drove to a little hotel, tiny little pension, bathroom down the hall, six rooms in the whole hotel. And we had a room with a window. And one of the things I had noticed about this hotel, which was very odd, was that two sides of it had no windows. It was just complete concrete. And I thought to myself, well, that's probably because they want to put up another building right next door, so why put one of them? That night, the wind blew so hard that I thought the hotel was going to be blown away. Now, I'm a sailor. I love the wind, and I know heavy winds, and this was like nothing I had ever experienced. What was happening was a Maltemi, one of those, like, Sirocco's, incredible winds out of Africa, was coming up across the Mediterranean and just hitting Crete and hitting this plane with a force that was absolutely terrifying. I was afraid that if we drove the car down the next day, it would be blown off the road, and that would be the end of us. Now, already I was being immersed in a real awe of the land and of the natural forces. This was not Chicago. This was not wind blowing through the Sears Tower as it crosses by LaSalle Street. This was the middle of nowhere with snow-capped mountains in the summer. Actually, it was May. And the next day, as we were driving around this plane to come back out, I said to my wife, you know, I was reading in the tourist guide that the, the decay, Mount Decay, is near here, and there's a cave there where Zeus was born, and I would like to see that. And we were both very, very disturbed at this point, possessed by unconscious forces. And as we drove out of town, there was a man who was hitching, and we said, where would you like to go? He must have been 65, 70. He said, well, I'm just going down the road. And so we went, and with our broken Greek and his broken English, we managed to communicate with one another that we were going to the DK cave. He said, I'll take you there. And I will show it to you for a fee, which, of course, came at the end of the tour, but <laughs> never mind. So he stopped and got some candles along the way, and we drove up to the side of a mountain where there was nothing but shrubbery, and then in the middle of it, this immense hole right down into the middle of the ground, which I'm sure most of you have seen at some point or another. It's like a limestone cave. People coming in, people going out. And as we went into the cave, all we could hear was the howling of the wind and this low moan. We walked down into the bowels of the cave, and he showed us the place where Zeus was placed by Gaia, his mother, to keep Kronos, his father, from eating him. Freudian, of course. Of course, it wasn't Freudian. Freud is Greek. You know, that's, you have to look at it that way, because Freud came later. And he showed us all the places where sacrifices had been made over the years to this Greek god, Zeus. And as we were down in the bowels of this cave, listening to the wind moan through the various entrances and exits up in the top of the cave, watching people with their candles coming down into the cave and seeing candles around us and the flickering on the walls, I thought to myself, Zeus is the sky god. Zeus lives up on Mount Olympus. You know, Zeus lives away from all of this. This is not the Zeus that I learned about when I was in college. Zeus, who was the sky god. Zeus, who rained down semen on women, who then conceived and gave birth to the gods. In this case, I think, uh, uh, Hercules. This was a different Zeus completely. And it wasn't until a couple years later that I realized that that was the Greek god who was there before that race of people came into Greece who had among their numbers the man who eventually wrote all the epics, Homer and Hesiod. These two people were not native Greeks. They came in, and they brought with them their sky gods because they were a nomadic people. They were wanderers. They couldn't have gods in the earth. Their gods were in the sky, and they accompanied them. So whenever we read Greek mythology, remember, and remember as this course goes through, and you talk about Zeus and all the others, that virtually every one of them, except for the possibility of, uh, of um, uh, my mind fails me. Who is who's the uh, the Greek counterpart of Bacchus? Uh, 
Dionysius. Dionysius, except possibly for Dionysius. They're all grafts, every one of them. So they all have these dual natures. And on the one hand, there was an attempt to explain what was happening in the earth, and then a later attempt to explain what was happening in the destiny of humankind. Now, it's 8 o'clock, and I realize this has been a kind of a long, trying monologue here. So let's take a break at this point and come back at 10 after, and we'll begin to look. I'm not going to stick too much with Greek mythology, although we could, because that's going to be in the next seven courses. What I would like to do at this point would be to take you a little farther into mythology and bring it more up to date. Okay, thank you. Now, the, uh, where do we go from here? The whole idea that myths were there to explain, to inspire, to warn, and to entertain was something that was taken very seriously by those people who believed the myths, by the Greeks and the Romans, etc., and so forth. In other words, these gods were real. They were not viewed as something that was an explanation for the way things were. They were the way things were. So there was no differentiation in the Greek mind between the mythological figure, the god, and some sort of explanation of reality. Now, in fact, there were cults that grew up around various gods. There were oracles that were set up. It was possible to go to an oracle and to deliver certain sacrifices by which you would try to influence the god in your favor, on your behalf, in, in whatever it was that you needed at the moment. And as life went on, people like Homer and people like Hesiod took these myths and wrote them down and created of them literature. Now, the Iliad and the Odyssey, which talk about the Trojan Wars and Achilles and Hector and Polyphemus and all the various, uh, the various uh, figures of, of those particular epics, became later on uh, the basis for the Aeneid over in, uh, in Latin literature. And even on into the Middle Ages and even on up into today, these myths that were originally written down way back when by people like Ovid uh, have become the basis for much of our modern literature. Take, for example, the myth of, or the story of, Pyramus and Thisbe. Do any of you know the story of Pyramus and Thisbe? Anyone recognize that one? Okay. Um, Pyramus and Thisbe were young lovers, a young man and a young woman, who loved each other dearly but were forbidden by their parents to see one another. As a result, every night before they went home to bed, they would meet on opposite sides of a wall that separated where the two lived, and each would kiss his or her side of the wall as a kind of kiss for the other, and home they would go. One night, they decided that this had gone on long enough and that it was time for them to run off together. And what they did was... They, were, they made arrangements to meet out by a particular tree, which is actually important to the myth, but I can't remember it. And what happened was, off they went to meet. Now, Pyramus was the man, Thisbe was the woman, and Pyramus, uh, no, Thisbe was the woman, got there first. And as she was waiting for her lover, a lion came down the path, returning from its hunt, and she fled. And as she fled, she dropped her cape, her white cape. And the lion, sniffing the cape and ripping it, got it all bloody and walked on. Pyramus, her lover, arrives later, finds her cape, and says to himself, she's been killed by a lion. It was wrong of me to have her come to such a dangerous place. The only thing of importance in my life is gone, and he falls upon his sword and kills himself. Thisbe, figuring that the lion is now gone, comes back, and discovers Pyramus lying dead, stoops down beside him, looks into his eyes, and he looks up and recognizes her for a moment and dies, at which point she takes his sword and falls upon it as well. Now that's the story of Pyramus and Thisbe. Does it sound at all familiar? <laughs> well, sure. Romeo and Juliet. Absolutely. What else? Well, not really so much Pyramus and Thisbe, but certainly the Romeo and Juliet motif was then recapitulated in Leonard Bernstein's West Side Story. This is a theme that has found resonance throughout the ages, right up until the present day. So one of the reasons that Greek myths are so interesting is that they form the basis for a lot of our literature. Does anyone know how to use that thermostat? We should probably turn it off at this point. Um, if not, I think I can figure it out here. I'll, I'll come over what happened to the Greek myths. Remember I was talking about animism and the whole idea that breath and spirit 
were that which enlivened an individual. Along about the 4th century B.C. comes a number of people, among which is a man named Democritus, who starts talking about the air that is around us as being separate and distinct from the breath that we breathe and animates us. And with this event comes the dawn of what we have now come to call science. Democritus begins to say, you know what? It's not just all these gods that are happening. There are some things that happen all the time independently of agency. There are some things going on that happen over and over again no matter how we try to influence the gods. There's something more going on here than we have been led to believe. Now, interestingly enough, this just happens to correspond with the decline of the Golden Age in Greece, the development of uh, some very poverty-stricken areas with their uh, uh, distaste and, and dissatisfaction with the way things were, and the birth of democracy, which is people governing themselves as opposed to appealing to the gods to take care of them, that sort of a thing. And yet it was recognized as science began to take the place of myth that myth could still get at some things that were very hard for science to portray. One of which, for example, would be um, uh, uh, the myth of um, Sisyphus, for example. Now here is Sisyphus. Sisyphus who observed Zeus having an affair and told on him and forever after was condemned to have to roll a rock up a hill and just as he gets it to the top, it rolls back down, and he has to start all over again. There was something in that story that people understood that was far more true to life than anything science could explain. It described the human condition, if not exactly why things were the way they were. Also, the other one that I think we all can identify with is the one of Prometheus. Prometheus, who brought fire to humankind, thereby allowing humankind to attain somewhat of the status of the immortals, who is then chained to a rock in punishment, there to have an eagle feeding on his liver for the rest of his life. We all know what some of the problems are that accompany the, the gaining of new knowledge. New knowledge is often a very dangerous thing. And that, that story portrays something in a way that science cannot it reminds me, for example, of the National Geographic a couple of months ago that was talking about how modern agricultural science has been brought to the Sahel in Africa. And rather than creating gardens of Eden, it has, in fact, lowered the water table and created greater desert in the area. So the, the knowledge and the good intention has had a very bad effect, or what Jung would call the shadow side of what we do. Now, when Democritus came down and began to talk about these things in the public forum, and science began to split off from myth, what we were really seeing here was a split between science and religion on the one hand, science and the arts on the other hand, and on the third hand, a split between science and psychology, because the myths were still explaining human experience and behavior in a way that science couldn't. Now, what science has done in the intervening years, with, with gaps of which we are all aware, is to systematically destroy the notion that there are gods surrounding us who influence our behavior. And science instead has said there are, in fact, very regular laws, very regular situations that exist, that exist not because of some influence of the divine, but because that's simply the way it is in the universe. And there are no gods out there telling us what to do. In effect, science has managed to exorcise all the demons. They don't exist. If you want the crops to grow, don't sit here and, and, and plead with this rock. Go out to your store and buy miracle Grow and spread it on the soil, and your crops will grow. And they're right. It's exactly what happens. No question about it. If you want to fly, don't make of yourself wings of wax and feathers, as did Icarus and Daedalus, and flap away. Go to your travel agent and get a flight on United, where technology has created a vehicle that can, in fact, fly. If you want to know why it rains like mad, don't look at the chicken you ate last night that was particularly pretty and consequently riled up the gods because it might have been one of Hera's. 
It's because this air mass coming out of Canada hit this air mass coming up from the Gulf, and they happened to hit right over your house, and it rained. In other words, there are no gods. And the great contribution, really, that Jung made to all of this was to say, science is absolutely right. There are no gods out there. They're all in here. They're still there. Every god that any myth has ever talked about is a function of the collective unconscious of humankind. That those forces which really rule our destiny are internal forces that previously were projected outward. So we're back to the thing we started the lecture off with, which is that the myths were the psyche's way of portraying itself. And this is what Jung was saying. Now, just parenthetically, if you're interested in, in Jung the man, Jung the man had very little interest in becoming a doctor. Uh, his goal in life was not to be a doctor or to be a psychologist. He wanted to be an archaeologist. His love was archaeology. And when he realized that there were virtually no jobs to be had from archaeology, he looked to zoology and felt that zoology was simply something that would be a teaching profession, and he wasn't interested in teaching. So he remembered that one of his great uncles had been a doctor and decided to go into medicine because he could then make a living at it, and in making a living at it, also have time possibly to study his first love, which was archaeology. Having then met Freud, you can imagine that this was an absolutely cosmic event in the life of Jung because suddenly he realized there was a way to combine archaeology and medicine, which is exactly what psychoanalysis is. It is the archaeology of the mind. And Jung then said that with his idea of archetypes, he was replicating archaeology, he was replicating zoology, in the sense that just like Eohippus is the archetypal horse from which all other horses have eventually evolved, the archetype is the psychological counterpart of the various complexes that we have in our mind or psyche today. So that we could track those back to their essential source also and thereby understand how humankind developed. And one of the places he looked for precedence was in myth and folktale and that sort of thing. Now that's going to be pretty well explained to you by the lecturers after tonight. The fact that the gods are within us. This is why we talk about facing the gods. That's why we talk about archetypes. But I'd like to do two things right now to prepare you for that. And the first is to give some sort of sense of what symbol is and why we study symbols. There's a very interesting quote from Levi Strauss who used to say that animals are not only good to eat, but they're good to think with. Which what he meant by that was that animals can portray things for us that can give rise to thought. Now, Jung himself says that every science is a function of the psyche and all knowledge is rooted in it. The effect of the unconscious images has something fateful about it. Perhaps, who knows, the eternal images are what are meant by fate. And then... The vision of the symbol is a pointer to the onward course of life, beckoning the libido toward a still distant goal. We can see that Jung is, is talking very much about destiny, about insight, about explanation, about inspiration, about the moral warning, everything that we were talking about earlier with regard to Greek myth, in terms of the psyche itself. And what Jung felt was that symbols were those elements in our lives that compelled our attention and directed our energies toward various things. Now, I like to think of symbols as basically being mechanisms for transmitting to consciousness those things in our lives which we loosely refer to as ineffable. Are you familiar with the word ineffable? Ineffable basically means you can't put your finger on it. You, you can't represent it graphically. It's ineffable. It is unable to be contained within the realm of rationality and logic. Now, when we study symbols, we're looking at trying to decipher their meaning. And when we try to decipher the meaning of symbols, we're trying to decipher two things. First, their ability to evoke a response. And secondly, that which is contained in their images that transcends content. So we're looking first at their effect, and then we're looking at their nature. Now, in the relationship between a symbol and a person who views the symbol, there is automatically a kind of 
recognition factor inherent in the individual that makes it possible for them to apprehend the symbol. And what this is, is the fact that the symbol is basically just a concrete thing like this table or that chair that becomes invested with something from our own unconscious that then brings that, that element to life and presents something to us. Again, it's the old idea of the psyche talking to itself. This is what symbols are. Now, when we talk about, uh, about um, things like myths and, and epic poems and that sort of thing, we're talking about symbols that have become discourse. And symbols that have become discourse become metaphors. Metaphors are the discourse form of symbols. Now, if you want to read about that, really the person who's done the best work as far as I'm concerned is Paul Ricoeur who happens to be right in this city, one of the most famous philosophers in the world, teaches at the University of Chicago. He has a very interesting little book called Interpretation Theory, in which he makes this point, and I think this will help to understand symbol and metaphor. He says that when we combine words, we have a combination of sense and reference. Words are the sense. They're what's actually being said, which when combined into a sentence, create a reference. And what he describes this as is the movement in which language transcends itself. Okay? Now, I'm just going to run through that again because I want it to be absolutely clear. Words have a sense to them. They have a meaning to them. In other words, we, when we see a word, we know what it stands for. We have a sense of what it's talking about. When we combine words together, we get a reference, a reference to a phenomenon, a reference to a state of being, a reference to a, a place, a, rep a reference to an experience. It creates reference. Sense, the words, when combined together, create reference, and this is the way in which language transcends itself. In other words, this is the way the words, it's a synergistic idea, when the words are combined together, they point beyond themselves to something else, something that is only able to be done through those words, but something that no individual word can express. So when we say define a metaphor, in other words, give me an example of a metaphor, now define it, we can't. Because what the, what the metaphor is, is that which the words point to, but no one of which actually represents itself. Now, where that becomes important to our work here, now let me see if I have it written down here somewhere, uh, so that I don't have to just come up with it now. Yeah, okay. When we try to understand ourselves, we are not only the object of the pursuit, but we are the mechanism as well. When we try to understand ourselves, when we look at ourselves, we are not only the object of scrutiny, we are the mechanism by which we are undertaking that scrutiny. So we are like a camera trying to take a picture of itself. Now, when we try to do that, it's virtually impossible. If I were to hand you a camera and say, here's a camera, describe to me the characteristics of this camera without taking it apart, because that's the way we are. We cannot take ourselves apart. And when we look at ourselves, we are looking at ourselves by virtue of ourselves. So how do we know that what we are looking at is really ourselves or just the way we're looking at it? The answer for Jungian psychology is to take the camera out, throw a film in it, and take picture after picture after picture after picture, and then look at the pictures. And by virtue of that fact, you can begin to understand how that camera is put together. You can analyze a lens, for example, by creating a grid and taking a picture of that grid and then matching the picture taken by the camera with the grid, and you'll see every distortion in the lens. You have to have pretty advanced uh, knowledge of optics to do that. Very advanced, yes. <laughs> this, yes, this, uh, this analogy is, is not airtight. But that's the only way it can be done. The only way we can get a sense of what the camera is like without taking the camera apart is to see how it sees. And this is precisely what the study of myth and the gods does. It's a study of the way in which the psyche has seen itself throughout the ages so that we can extrapolate backwards and understand the psyche basically through understanding the images that the psyche has put together over the ages. And this is the whole point of looking at myths from a psychological perspective. It's to understand the human, to understand the way we are and the way we function. Now, traditionally, science and religion 
have been somewhat at odds with regard to the interpretation of symbols. From the religious perspective, symbols exist because of incarnation. The everyday things around us are invested with a significance. In other words, the symbol is sacred because it is sacred. Meaning derives from that which happens to us when we see the symbol. Agency penetrates that symbol. There's something in it that is speaking to us. The cross, uh, the, uh, the uh, Buddha, whatever, the, 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 uh, the uh, let's think of other symbols that are, that are very important. The Torah. The Torah is not just a collection of words, it's a reference. And it's the reference that's important. And it contains within it the meaning. Now for science, on the other hand, the everyday is invested with significance due to the predisposition of the observer to experience the image in a certain way. In other words, we're talking about location. Science says the location of the meaning is in the observer. Religion says the location of the meaning is in the observed. And that there's a communication there. Now, when we begin to talk about all of this, we have to begin to say, okay, if Jungian psychology is a science, which it most assuredly is, and if it's also a mythology, in other words, if it's also studying myth, which it most assuredly is, what happens to this old kind of controversy that goes on between the gods on the one hand and science on the other? I would like to propose two things. I would like to propose to you that in our modern culture today, we have a replication culturally of what Edward Edinger in his book Ego and Archetype called the ego and the self and the ego-self axis. Now what Edinger says is that as the ego develops out of the self, eventually it gets far enough out to where it begins to see what it's connected to and what it grew out of. That's a, it's a schematic kind of thing that sometimes helps to understand it. When we are born, we are like a, a large unconscious entity with the potential for consciousness within it. As we grow, consciousness actually begins to emerge from the unconscious, even though this entire organism for Jung is called the self, and that eventually consciousness becomes so well differentiated from the unconscious that it begins to see that its center is connected to something else. In other words, it begins to, as the center of consciousness gets beyond this little circle here, it begins to see that there's a connection here with something else. And in a very uh, brief, cryptic way, what, Ed what, what I'm telling you about Edinger is that he's saying that the more psychologically advanced we become, the more conscious we become, the more we have to return to the fact that what is generating us is something different from our consciousness, that there are forces going on in our lives over which we have very little control, and they're not gods, and they're not biochemical drives. There's something else going on, that there is something in the organism that seems to be guiding the organism. Now, I think our culture is in this stage here. Now, this is, this is basically in the category of irresponsible speculation, but it's, it's something that's fun to do, and it also leads to something else that I find very interesting. Right now, we have a large amount of consciousness in our Western culture here that is not very aware of the fact that it's emerging out of a large unconscious situation that really determines the essence of its being. In other words, we're, we're becoming conscious, but in the words of Campbell, we're getting cut off from unconsciousness. Now, every now and then, says Campbell, what's going to happen is that this balance is going to have to be readjusted. So what we find occurring periodically are stages of what he calls creative mythologizing. In other words, suddenly, we just completely go away from this rationality and dive back into something that's really basically fairly unconscious and is an attempt to gain our connection with the, 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 the uh, unconscious ground of our being. Now, one of those that, that he mentions, and I agree, is the use of LSD back in the late 60s, early 70s. And the whole, uh, the whole movement that occurred around that in our culture, around psychedelics and the teachings of Don Juan and the Yaki way of knowledge and all of this, that in fact we lost touch with something that was clearly present in our lives, clearly had a profound effect on what was happening to us, 
but which was just simply not representable rationally. Now, if I were going to find today an example of over-consciousness, in other words, the, the problematic development of consciousness or consciousness's development to a problematic degree, I would look to law, to our legal system. I would say that in our culture today, we have become so concerned with defining exactly what is that it has pulled us away from the ground of our being periodically. For example, when our legislatures try to define exactly what a law means and then it's sent out to the courts and lawyers debate among one another what the law means, we can end up with so many rules and regulations as to exactly how the law is going to be applied that the law cannot be applied anymore. It's an unwieldy system. A friend of mine said to me the other day, you know how we could reform government overnight? We could say that lawyers can't run for office. Now, psychology has this happening to it incredibly. Uh, if you belong to APA, as I belong to APA, it is against the code of ethics of APA to stand up and speak as a psychologist about anything which has not been empirically proven. In other words, if I stand up here and say to you, I'm a psychologist and there are these things as archetypes, I'm guilty of malpractice because it has not been proven that that is so. If I stand up here and say to you, it has been proven that kindness to children aids in their psychological development, and I can't tell you which studies have backed that up, I'm guilty of malpractice. Now, this is obviously for one reason and one reason alone. First of all, if I am called into court as a psychologist, and there's a divorce decree going on, and there's a question of who's going to get the kids, and the lawyers turn to me and say, well, look, tell us, which is the better parent? The only thing I could say in clear conscience was, it's time for lunch, and then take the train to L.A. or something and get out of town. But unfortunately, we don't all have that kind of freedom. In our culture today, things have to be defined. They have to be substantiated. Now, this is consciousnesses getting out of touch with those elements of its nature that just simply are a matter of reference, not sense. Words have sense. If I say the word boat... You know what the word boat means. We can look at a boat. We can see a boat. If I say, life is like a boat on the sea, we're creating a reference that is not going to be able to be picked out of any one of those words. It's not going to be able to be proven. We get away from our roots when this happens. I would say that with regard to the legal system, which is a very necessary part of our society, we have not yet seen this. And we may never be able to do that because there are some elements of consciousness that simply cannot enter the unconscious at all. However, if we want to look at another phenomenon, if we want to look at a modern-day myth, I would suggest we look at the phenomenon of Sandalik 69202. Does anyone know what Sandalik 69202 is? It's the type 2 supernova that just blew up in the large Magellanic cloud. Very good. Now, the reason I would want to look at that is that High ener no eraser. I'm doomed to live with the things I've created. Uh, nuclear physics has entered into a realm of thought at this point that approaches the mythological. High energy physics, for example, talks about things like charm and color with regard to high energy particles. And Sandalik 69202 was a star that blew up, as you all know, about three months ago. Now, of course, it didn't blow up about three months ago. It blew up about 170,000 years ago. But the effects of it reached us about three months ago. So for all intents and purposes, we think it happened about three months ago. A type 2 supernova, without boring you to distraction, is a star which has a number of shells in it that are burning. Now, most, most stars are basically a... Uh, uh, an envelope of hydrogen burning over a core of helium. That's basically what our sun is here. Sandalik 69202 was a star that had advanced far enough that much of the hydrogen had been completely burned up. And in becoming completely burned up, had been transformed into helium. Now, helium is a little harder to burn. It takes more time. It takes more energy to burn. Helium, when it burns up, becomes, now there are about eight shells here, so if you know this, you can correct me, but I'm not totally aware. Helium, when it burns up, goes into oxygen. Oxygen, when it burns up, goes into silicon. 
Silicon, when it burns up, I think, goes into carbon. And carbon, when it burns up, goes into iron. Now, what happens with all of these various shells in the star is that they're in a state of equilibrium. The pressure with which helium burns is sufficient to support the weight of the hydrogen envelope around it. Now, mind you, this is a cross-section. These are, these are concentric spheres. Okay? When helium begins to break down into oxygen, the temperature and the pressure of the burning oxygen has to be high enough to be able to support the envelope of helium and the envelope of hydrogen. Now, the problem is that because oxygen burns uh, much less readily than does hydrogen, it takes far more energy to keep the oxygen burning. When oxygen begins to burn totally up, it gets converted into silicon, down to carbon, down to iron. Well, you can imagine what it's like to burn iron. Now, what's happened is that a star that originally was just a, a big envelope of hydrogen has burned up enough hydrogen that it's created a heavier layer underneath of helium, which has burned up enough that it's created underneath a heavier layer of oxygen, which has burned up enough that it's created a heavier layer underneath of silicon all the way down to iron. And what happens is that eventually, because iron takes so much energy to burn, that it doesn't burn very well, and it doesn't hold up this envelope of carbon very well. And when it doesn't hold up this envelope of carbon very well, that carbon collapses into the iron, which allows the silicon, which is above it, to collapse into this and the helium and the hydrogen. And what happens is that this large burning sphere suddenly goes and collapses. Electrons, you know that protons and electrons create atoms and that electrons are in rings that are very far away from the protons and the nucleus of the atom and the neutrons. What happens is that the pressure from this forces electrons and protons together into neutrons. All the atoms disappear and we have nothing but neutrons, which then become so compacted that they explode. And one of the first things that happens when they explode is they shoot out neutrinos, which are these little bundles of energy, which we manage to actually see here on Earth in some of our registering devices before the light from this star got to us. So approximately uh, three hours before the light from this exploding star got to the Earth, the neutrinos went through our detectors. And what that meant was that it took three hours for the light to get from the side of the star out to the other side and, and come straight out. Now, why do I tell you all of this? Well, one thing, because it's fascinating. It's great stuff. We've got this great exploding thing out there. The other thing is because only in these kinds of stars do you get the metals. Okay? Most other stars are hydrogen and helium. So far as modern stellar physics knows, the only source of metals in the universe are type II supernova. Now, what becomes very interesting about that, and what, in my mind, raises the level of this science to myth, is that we and everything around us is made out of the metals. In other words, every one of us here and everything that is here is made of the remnants of type two supernova explosions. This is a creation myth. In other words, all throughout life, humankind has wanted to know where it came from. And we have the old myths, uh, for example, in, uh, in Egypt, of Set and Nut separating the earth from the sky and creating a place for humankind to be. We have Genesis, where mankind, humankind, is created out of the mud. Okay, breath is blown in, the old animist theory. Now we have the fact that in, that, in fact, scientifically, where we all come from is from type 2 supernova. We now have a modern scientific myth. And in fact, what's happening, as far as I can see, in high energy physics, is that high energy physics has gotten to this stage where it has become conscious of the fact that it is connected to and derived from something that just simply cannot be expressed in traditional scientific terms anymore. We have things like the Heisenberg Principle. Uh, Einstein, with the, uh, with the curvature of space and the space-time continuum, gave rise to books that, that 100 years ago would have been unthinkable. Books like the Tao of Physics, the Dancing Wooly Masters. The question then becomes, do we ever get out of an age of myths? Do we ever get away from the creation myths? Is Sandalak 69202 a new god who may gave birth to, to us or to someone else or to something else along the way. This is the role of living myth. 
when you attend this course and learn about the various gods, and in learning about the various gods, gain insight into your own behavior, remember one thing that I think is crucially important for all of this, and that is that the very process of looking at myths in an attempt to understand the psyche of the individual is itself a mythological process. No matter how far we go, we keep repeating the same things over and over. Not the same contents, but the same references. This is what Jung meant by the archetype. I'd like to give you one last quote about all of this, if this disturbs you at all, which it really shouldn't. Symbols emerge, grow, and fade away in the course of history. No individual can make them, change them, or destroy them according to a personal whim because it is a part of history. And then finally, this is a quote from Hayakawa in The Language of Vision. We've all been taught in looking at pictures to look for too much. Something of the quality of a child's delight in playing with colors and shapes has to be restored to us before we learn to see again, before we unlearn the terms in which we ordinarily see. Like Joseph Conrad in all his writings, the purpose of this course is not to teach you reality, but to help you to increase your delight and ability to see. So, that's it. We have ten minutes. Anyone who would like to ask any questions? Uh, make any comments? Love to hear them. Uh, those of you who uh, are interested in the, uh, the twins and the tigers can get home. Anybody know what the twins and the tigers are? <laughs> well, you know, the Jungian groups are not participating in contemporary mythology. It's the American League playoffs. <laughs> James Hillman did a wonderful discourse once in Zurich uh, in a class there about the, symbolic, the, the symbolism of baseball, the idea that, that the goal is to get home, you know, the sort of thing that the, 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 the object is, uh, of, of everyone's attention is a sphere, that the, uh, the game is played on a, rect on, on a square, in the center of which is the pitcher. Oh. With a large phallus. Pardon me? With a large phallus. Yes, yes, right, which, which you're supposed to connect with that wholeness of self. Okay, thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of the course. podcast is distributed under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. Share it all you like as long as you maintain the attribution to the speaker, but please do not change it or sell it. If you like this episode, tell your friends about us or leave us a review on iTunes. For more information about classes, training programs, videos, audio, this podcast, or to find a Jungian analyst near you, visit our website, www.youngchicago.org.